Okay, Friday afternoon. You know, there ought to be, they give out those challenge coins. There ought to be some kind of a challenge coin given to folks who are here after, you know, after 1 p.m. on a Friday afternoon. Maybe take a Canadian coin home with you as a, you know, commemorative thing or something like that. So, yeah, thanks for staying. Good to be here. Okay, and um, I'm, I'm going to talk about observing the Great Lakes and a tiny bit of history, but then, but then go into, you know, sort of what I think uh, future monitoring might look like in, in the Great Lakes. And uh, um, so that's, um, um, that, that's just really more, more of my view of, of where I think things are going. And sometimes I refer to myself as an observing systems researcher. Sometimes I do sinkhole research, you know, that sort of thing. But it's, uh, I don't know how those two things intersect. Okay, um, what do I mean by observations? Um, I mean um, instrument-based observations. And, and what you're seeing here is the last uh, Ponar elutriation uh, by Tom Nalepa uh, before he retired. And so Ponars, grabbing a bottom sample, uh, a zooplankton net, those are all incredibly important things that provide ground truth. I'm not talking about those things. I'm not minimizing the importance of those things. I'm also not talking about research vessels. I'm talking about um, technology. And I, before I gave this talk, I, I went, I talked to a number of people either on the phone or in the lab and, uh, and kind of got their opinion on, uh, what, what technologies had the greatest impact on Great Lakes research. And I said Great Lakes and coastal, but, uh, that this is a Great Lakes crowd. So, um, so key Great Lakes and coastal instrumentation, um, are listed here. Uh, just for instance, Debbie said that uh, uh, remote sensing combined with research vessels is super important. Um, there are some folks who said sequential se sediment samplers. There was a, a real strong connection. Craig Stowe said, really the advancement is that we were able to have fast enough processors, enough memory uh, and embedded processors that allowed us to do time series observations. Time series observations came out uh, you know, in highly ranked. I didn't do an official ranking, uh, but uh, so, and then temperature strings uh, were another important one. We know, many of us know the value of the Southern Lake Michigan temperature data set, more than 30 years of observations that have told us how greatly the Southern Basin, or at least uh, the Great Lakes community or the Great Lakes um, system is, uh, is changing uh, and uh, possibly impacting the uh, ecosystem uh, that, we're, uh, that we're working with. So I won't go into all of those. It would take me a long time. Uh, one that was rather important, I thought, was one that a, a Terry Miller, a retired technician, uh, mentioned that the reason that we got these big episodic events, or uh, we got big proposals funded like the episodic events Great Lakes Experiment back in 1998, uh, was that we had this reputation for having instrumentation expertise. So, you know, I, my, tr my roots trace back through the Marine Instrumentation Lab, and that expertise allows you to then get proposals that allows you to sort of build on that. And that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. Um, this is an, um, this is, uh, the first animation of Dave Schwab's, uh, circulation model using the Princeton Ocean model. And, uh, it's not the first run of the model, but it's the first time they actually animated it. It's really, a, it's a beautiful thing to watch. It still is a beautiful thing to watch, I think, but that was made possible by some advances in technology. We went from these vector averaging current meters on the left there, just whole stacks of them to get one observation, you had to have one meter in the water column. And then we went to acoustic Doppler current profilers, which allowed you to deploy this much smaller, lighter uh, system that could give you, uh, you know, even up to a quarter meter uh, uh, slices of the water column. Uh, and it just revolutionized everything. And around that same time, uh, the muscles came in and the muscles were actually attaching to those mechanical rotors on the VACM. So they wouldn't have been of use to us anyway. And that data then, there's a Boletsky paper that includes that satellite image, which a number of people mentioned, satellite observations, an early satellite image of the southern base of the Lake Michigan under the Episodic Events Project. Uh, you, you get this, these two currents during north, strong north winds that run down each side of the lake, and they meet there where that bump is uh, at St. Joseph, Michigan. And that's what DEMA was verifying. And you can kind of see that when you get the strong north winds there. That's what the arrow is, is the, is the wind. Uh, right there, and you can kind of see things start to spin, and there's a two, two gyre motion, and that's what spun up that galaxy looking thing in the satellite image. Uh, but, you know, I think about that a couple of weeks ago, we had a warm spot sort of get sucked up into that and get moved off shore. And, and I think, you know, that may be the mechanism, Andrea, for the, why that happens. <laughs> um, 
So there you go. You see it in real time. Um, okay, so this image again, thank you, Andrew, for introducing this, is the Real-Time Coastal Observation Network. It's referred to as a NOAA Coastal uh, Critical or NOAA Critical Observing System of Record. Uh, you know, I think of it as this connection that we have with our internal uh, network to nodes around the Great Lakes. This is GLURL's sort of um, observation network view of the world. This does not include all the observations that are done, being done by universities, by the Weather Service, by the National Data Buoy Center, et cetera. Uh, in the in the blue or meteorological stations, when we first made those real time, uh, we uh, transitioned that technology. Uh, it's a very inexpensive technology for getting meteorological observations on the water, which under the Eagle project, it turned out that those on water observations were much better at forecasting waves, uh, currents, uh, and, uh, and wave direction and currents uh, than, uh, than, than relying on observations that were maybe at an airport nearby or something like that. So a technology transition that was just done by word of mouth and not without, with, without a technology transition plan. Buoys, we've always designed the buoys. Uh, here's a group of buoys that went out earlier. We've, we've had in mind that we were gonna have used cabled systems. Uh, and so our buoys um, kind of looked like this. Um, they, you had on the right is our underwater hub designed completely uh, and built by us uh, in our marine instrumentation laboratory. Um, in it, in it, so you can plug in multiple sensors and that center plug is an ethernet plug, which ultimately connects us back to our laboratory. Uh, and so just images of that with instruments on it and that sort of thing. Um, and then the results of that, we deploy one of those in Saginaw Bay. Here are some results from Saginaw Bay in yellow uh, over an 11 year period we've been observing. Uh, so we deploy that package on the bottom. Uh, we've been observing these hypoxia, epi episodic hypoxia. And those episodic hypoxia events Again, time series data uh, over a long period of time, over yeah, time series, over a long period of time. Uh, in yellow events that are, uh, uh, so you have the hourly duration on the, on the uh, Y axis and then on the axis of, axis, of course, the year. But those, the times when you're experiencing four milligrams per liter or less of oxygen on the bottom, uh, it, it has been increasing over the last 10 years. And the times when you're, when you're experiencing two milligrams per liter or less uh, are also increasing, but that's kind of like double counting too. But, um, but, it's, um, but it's a concerning trend uh, that we're, we're monitoring and we're monitoring it because of the way we sort of built this system. Um, okay, so, oh, and the other thing I want to point out is that we would, that wouldn't be possible if there hadn't been an advancement in a sensor again. So we had these Clark cell sensors that after about, three weeks, they were no good. You couldn't leave them out. Now we have these optical sensors with wipers and we can leave them out for six months or even a year. Um, and so this is what I'm talking about. The, um, th this is, so that was through 21. This is, in, this is from 2022. But you see those oxygen, those, hypo those episodic hypoxia events going all the way to zero multiple times and sometimes lasting for days. And that can have a really uh, significant impact on uh, the, uh, the benthic community. <clears throat> Uh, okay, and then our first deployment of a cabled system. So those are buoys, they have to be retrieved every year. This is the first deployment of a cabled system uh, with our sister lab in, in, uh, uh, at AOML in Florida, and we didn't have to worry about ice, uh, but <laughs> we, we did want to demonstrate or test out some kind of a cabled uh, observatory. Uh, we had a, a high bandwidth link offshore, but then a cabled system running off Tennessee, uh, the Tennessee Reef Light uh, in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, Doran Mason and I wrote this proposal that was to uh, OAR or our, our headquarters, uh, and uh, we we deployed water quality sensors, wave sensor, uh, an acoustic Doppler current profiler that was measuring waves and currents, and then we had this bioacoustic system that could detect fish as it scanned across this reef, but side by side is a video system that could uh, uh, see big fish and small fish, and we had on video what they were, which was, uh, uh, you know, not only cool, but it was useful. Uh, but this barracuda parked behind that about two hours after we, um, and we saw that fish on video regularly as it was trying to ambush small fish by hiding behind our system. So we, I don't know if that biases the data or not. Um, okay, and then a lot of our observations are, are happening in Western Lake Erie. Uh, we have what I refer to as Russ Miller's buoys. They're under the recon network, uh, but they're also tied with our uh, weekly sampling that Reagan Herrera leads. Uh, and and uh, but one particular station, one one station in particular, uh, is our cabled system at Reno Beach, um, and that system 
this is retrieving it last year. It has, uh, it's just covered with zebra mussels. I don't, I don't remember if they're, I think many of them are zebra mussels, at least in Western Lake Erie, but if Ashley's in the audience, she can correct me. So uh, Ben and Kristen there depicted uh, after they retrieved it, they had changed clothes because they got pretty messy retrieving it. Uh, and then uh, October 31st, uh, we redeployed it with a fisheries acoustic system uh, and, uh, and the same sensors that we typically deploy as well as a fluoroprobe for measuring uh, phytoplankton communities. Um, and then they're back at home, there are folks who are working on the software and that sort of thing to get this data up and running. Laura, Katie, uh, and uh, Kyle and Kristen and Ben deployed it. Um, okay, so what do we do with that? January, a winter storm. We had a lot of warm weather, but we did have a period of very cold weather. Uh, what you're seeing there on the left is, uh, is wind speed uh, in the top left, wind speed uh, meters per second. Uh, and so 20 meters per second, you're around uh, 40 knot winds sustained and then gusting up to 50. And then it was followed by a second storm that was around 30 knot winds sustained. Uh, and then you see this really dramatic temperature change in the bottom there. We're down to minus 15 degrees centigrade uh, when, we, uh, when that storm sort of passes through and the cold front comes in, but the winds remained. Uh, and then here we have uh, lake effect snow taking place, a Veers image from January 14th. And then the water temperature um, got very low. It actually got uh, below zero degrees centigrade, which in freshwater, uh, you know, it should be frozen. Uh, but uh, it actually wasn't frozen. Uh, but uh, it did finally freeze later on. But those strong winds are keeping that water, even though it's less than zero degrees, uh, uh, liquid mostly. So, uh, but then later on, the uh, we did get ice cover. What's what you're seeing there in the lower left is ice thickness from an acoustic Doppler current profiler. This is something that Nathan Hawley and Dima Boletsky have been doing for years, and others are picking it up. But we did see this break in the ice, and that's what that gap in the middle is. And, we, and it does maybe somewhat tell us what the ice thickness was. We couldn't get out there and verify it because the ice didn't get quite thick enough. And then there's an image of the ice cover from the same station. Um, what we saw, so on the right is a typical sort of resuspension event. You have a lot of acoustic return. This is from our acoustic zooplankton fish profiler. Uh, you have a big return from the sediment in the water column. On the left, uh, what, what we think happened when it was less than zero, when the water was less than zero, six meter depth here, uh, the wind is blowing and it's turbulent and the water is moving. We think we're seeing frazzle ice. Uh, that's, you know, there's no proof for that, but we did our optical sensors completely stopped working as the, uh, uh, the, we think the ice just formed right around the sensor package. So it was just really just a bizarre period of time. And then here's what you would normally get out of an acoustic zooplankton fish profiler on the left, daytime fish are moving around. That's what those streaks are, Doran Mason says. Um, and then uh, and on the right at night, there seems to be less activity. That's flipped around, what would be normal, but this is a shallow turbine system. So maybe it's different. Okay. so. Other things that we're doing, so it's a cabled system operating year round and under ice. Uh, that we're, we're trying to get AUVs out for winter observations and to extend our spatial coverage of that network. Um, so uh, we've demonstrated a bunch of different technologies. Russ Miller has been, has been using a gliders for a number of years. He's ready to take the risk of putting those gliders out uh, with a, on a project that I'm leading in the central basin of Lake Erie. Uh, in open water, not under ice. We demonstrated, or, and, and then on the right is a uh, Ambari long range AUV, but this one's operated by Woods Hole Oceanographic, and they do want to get that vehicle up under ice. We, we did a demonstration project there in the center with a Saab uh, AUV. Uh, it's actually mostly operated as a remote, remotely operated vehicle, and uh, we, we demonstrated that we actually demonstrated with a company here in Michigan who's the one who uses those things the most in the world. Uh, and uh, they, they use them in power plants for uh, uh, checking out uh, water intakes and things like that. That's one, one example. Uh, but they, uh, they work, we worked with Saab and that company and we got it to actually operate. Um, wow. Yeah, turn the volume down. <laughs> okay, so you want to be able to hear me? There we go. Okay, um, <clears throat> and you can still hear me. 
So that's the vehicle going under uh, autonomously uh, for one of the first times. Uh, in the middle there is a docking station uh, that it could park in, deliver its data, uh, and then go back out in a limited fashion. We didn't fully download all the data, uh, but and we didn't fully charge it. And on the left there is a Teledyne fuel cell, a hydrogen fuel cell, 450 kilo. Uh, so I, yeah, a four, I say 400 here, but I think it was actually 450 kilowatt hour hydrogen fuel cell. Um, and we collected a lot of different uh, data uh, offshore during that autonomous demonstration. Uh, key being that we could have a recon node, we could have maybe not a fuel cell like this, but we have other fuel cells in mind that were actually, we have one in house that are lower power that would power, would recharge a system. It could deliver its data to a recon station after it's gone out there and spatially mapped uh, a, a larger area. So that's the vision. Um, and um, okay, and then here's the uh, one of Russ Miller's gliders, a Cooper Institute glider being deployed in Lake Michigan last year to try to lead up to this work that we're going to do in Lake Erie to sort of demonstrate some of the things we want to demonstrate there. Um, okay, so as we're going out to this lighthouse, I was talking to the Coast Guard person who was taking me out, and he said, This is the farthest, uh, this, this light is the farthest offshore of any light in the uh, under the jurisdiction of the United States. And that includes Alaska, but there really aren't a lot of lighthouses in Alaska, I guess is what you might think. But um, that surprised me. But I so I Wikipedia it and, and actually is uh, well, according to Wikipedia, it's also true. Um, <clears throat> 24 miles from land, but it's, you know, it's 30 miles from any of the nearest ports. So think about this, uh, this station with um, some of Andrea's drones uh, landing on it and taking off, uh, uh, landing on it, recharging, collecting data, going back and delivering it. Uh, and then in the water, you have a cabled system that is uh, recharging autonomous vehicles, getting its own single point data. And, uh, and then uh, those vehicles are, are repeatedly over the winter, all year long, collecting data over large spatial areas, especially at times when we can't be out there and it's not safe to be out there. Okay, you don't do this without a lot of help. And these are folks from the Marine Instrumentation Group. I even include the Galoral Admin folks because we don't buy things unless they're, they're on, on board with us in the, the vessel clue on the right and then the Cooperative Institute. Um, I just kind of want to leave with this picture. Our data goes for research. Our data goes for understanding what's happening in the, in the Great Lakes. But here's a, 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 a sail border. I think that's what they're called, uh, is, uh, is out there using uh, or at least going through our camera image, I pictured that maybe they looked at the winds ahead of time uh, or they looked at them afterwards to see what they were in. Uh, we also, you know, a lot of thanks to uh, the Great Lakes Restoration, uh, Great Lakes Observing System, uh, our partners and National Data Buoy Center who were either, who are funding some of this work. We fund a lot of it internally in NOAA, uh, but uh, uh, data is going to Great Lakes Observing System and the National Data Buoy Center. Uh, and then I, I think about this relationship between the Cooperative Institute uh, and Glural, it's a back and forth relationship. Sometimes we're leading and they're, uh, they're then sort of picking up sort of what, what gets uh, uh, spun off of these projects. And sometimes they're leading in the early research phases and we're, we're taking advantage of it and turning it into a product. So that is it, thank you.